Okay, welcome everybody to another episode of Skeptical Inquirer Presents. I'm Jim Underdown, Executive Director of the Center for Inquiry West in Los Angeles, and the Chair and Founder of the Center for Inquiry Investigations Group. And I'm very excited to have two people that I spoke to about six months ago on Point of Inquiry. Go listen to that episode of our podcast uh, with us tonight. Uh, Gail Sinatra and Barbara Hofer are here, and they're going to give a presentation, but let's just sort of set the stage here for a second. We're going to be talking about science denial. They wrote a book called Science Denial, Why It Happens and What to Do About It, and it just has blown my mind for a long time that the science that got us to the moon, that cleaned our drinking water, that puts computers in our hands, that did all these wonderful things that make the modern world what it is, grow food. I mean, the, the list is endless cure diseases. That same science is being challenged and denied mostly by people who don't know what they're talking about, but have a pretty good voice uh, in today's technology. And it's, it's crazy because the bad information, the misinformation is out there in a big way. So today we're gonna to be talking about um, what has happened and what to do about it. I read this book and one of the great things about it is they list some ways for us to try to fight back a little bit and uh, do something about this uh, spread of misinformation. So let's introduce our, our two guests today. Uh, Dr. Barbara Hofer is Professor of Psychology Emerita at Middlebury College and a fellow of the American Psychological Association. She received her PhD from the University of Michigan and from the Combined Program in Education and Psychology with a Certificate in Culture and Cognition and an EDM in Human Development from Harvard. Dr. Gail Sinatra is the Stephen H. Crocker Chair and Professor of Psychology and Education at the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. She received her BS, MS, and PhD in Psychology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Jim. I'm, uh, I'm so glad I, I could hear this a hundred times. It's, it's part of my job and um, we love hearing from uh, people like both of you who've looked deeply into these issues and uh, hearing <clears throat> what your ideas are. So I'm just gonna hand it over to you and you're gonna do a PowerPoint. And uh, later on, uh, we will uh, have some Q and A. So while you're at home watching this, you can write it, your questions in the q and I might mention that only um, myself and our um, secret mo moderators can see these questions. So if you're uh, trying to have some wacky idea addressed to the whole rest of everybody listening, it ain't gonna happen. So just uh, limit your questions to actual questions and um, we'll pick some of those and uh, right after the presentation, hit as many as we can before the end of the hour. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Gail and Barbara, and uh, thanks for being here. Thanks very much. I'm going to turn my video off for a second just to get the uh, screen sharing our presentation. So if you'll give me one second to do that, I will get going. And Barbara, you can tell me if this looks okay to you. Yep. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. We're delighted to be talking about science denial, uh, why it happens and what to do about it, our new book and the concepts from that book. So public understanding of science is the major theme that we really address. And we have to stop and ask ourselves why does it matter? Uh, well, we think it matters that democratic societies uh, need to depend on an informed citizenry to make 
uh, informed decisions about scientific issues. And that's for their own good health and for well-being of themselves in the community, the nation, the planet. And we really saw this play out in the last couple of years with vaccines, mm -hmm. vaccine hesitance, and a lot of uh, myths and disinformation around that and some actual legitimate questions. We see it play out in other scientific topics too, like climate change and fracking, stem cell research. So um, it's a very pervasive issue. Well, you know, we'd be the first to say, you know, it is challenging to evaluate scientific claims and understand the premises of science, particularly in such complex topics as climate change. So it's understandable that there's some difficulty with these uh, processes, but there is quite a disconnect between scientists' opinions and that of the general public, and that we feel is concerning. So is it a science literacy issue? Is that the problem? Well, we would argue as educators, we would definitely like to see improved science education along the lines of what's um, proffered in the next generation science standards. Those are national recommendations for how to teach science. And there's a lot of things in the NGSS that um, if we fully implement them would be very helpful to teach um, science in a way that was um, more about the process of science and how scientists know what they know. But we'd also admit that content knowledge is not enough. These are difficult, complex subjects that are difficult to understand and the kinds of skills that the students need to evaluate scientific evidence really transcends content. Um, the, a good example is that scientists know not only uh, the content of what they do, but they know a process, a method of doing business, how to find out information and how to find out what uh, evidence to accept or reject. And it's that process that students need more exposure to the origins of knowledge, the production of knowledge, and how it gets validated. And also why science is also limited. Science can't answer every question and they need to know which questions science can and can't answer. So one of the things that Gail just mentioned is the importance of understanding the premises of science and how that might be difficult for some people. But the AAAS, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, has laid these out very nicely as four basic principles. And these are part of the next generation science standards. So what they tell us is these four tenets is that the world is understandable through systematic study. And yet science can't provide complete answers to all questions, nor does it attempt to. It's a particular domain of interest. Scientific knowledge is durable. You know, it builds on the past. It's it's lasting, and yet the ideas are always subject to change. And this is such a critical component to understand, and yet it's probably the one that's often most misunderstood. You know, we think about how often people confuse this tentativeness that scientists prize for uncertainty, and that is highly problematic. So you can think back to how people got a crash course in scientific uncertainty during the novel coronavirus. We'd never seen it before. They didn't know how it was transmitted and we were all washing our groceries down for a while. And Gail and I cheered when we didn't have to do that anymore. Whoops, did you just jump ahead? Oh, I did, I'm sorry, I thought you were ready. <laughs> no, so we, we cheered that and thought it was a great idea that they knew more now about it being trans, uh, transmitted in a, as a respiratory virus, but other people thought this was flip-flopping that somehow scientists weren't certain, so how could they trust scientists? Well, that's a misunderstanding of science. So Naomi Oreskes at Harvard, a historian of science, has talked about why should we trust science? Why does it matter to do this? And so again, she's laid out basic tenets that we need to understand, that what science does is rely on empirical evidence carefully collected and analyzed. And so we think about the scientific method, but in fact, the method is much broader than that. The various ways that various fields go about getting evidence and analyzing it. And it builds on prior findings, accumulating evidence over time. It's a collective enterprise. It relies on peer review and the expert vetting of ideas, theories, and results. So there's a self-correcting mechanism there in that 
collective enterprise so that, uh, yes, there are mistakes and we know them. We talk about some of them in the book, some of the major ones. And then we look at how does it self-correct? How does that work? And then another component here that Lee McIntyre, who's a philosopher of science, talks about is the value of a scientific attitude. And I think this has been particularly important to me in my own teaching. But this idea that what I want to foster is an, a scientific attitude, which he defines as an openness to seek new evidence and a willingness to change one's mind in light of new evidence. And I think that's particularly critical to think about if you are a teacher or you're working with young people or others in general who may have you know, the ability to form new ideas about science, that this is what we want to foster, regardless of the discipline in which we teach, really. So this was certainly important to me in teaching psychology. And yet we have science, denial, doubt, and resistance. So when Gail and I wrote the book, we really wanted to make sure we weren't just talking about denial, that hardcore belief-based stance that rejects evidence, but that we wanted to talk about all the ways in which all of us can doubt or resist scientific findings. And we knew from cognitive psychology, social psychology, that we all have particular biases that allow us to resist or doubt. Um, one of the important things to distinguish though is denial really is this belief-based stance. So climate change is a hoax, the earth is flat, vaccinations can cause autism. But we think of those things as cafeteria denial for most people. There are very few people who have rejected science outright. They fly to the Flat Earth Conference, by the way, or drive or whatever. They're not walking there. They, they trust the science behind many of these other things, as Jim talked about. How is it that we can trust science on all those things and then reject it when it's inconvenient for us? So we, they may choose what to believe and what to deny in the way of strong scientific findings. But doubt and resistance are really more common than denial, especially when findings don't fit with personal beliefs or conflict with social identity or require deep analysis, the things we'll talk about as we look at psych psychological reasons. One important thing to point out here is doubt can also be manufactured by vested interest. So Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway wrote a lovely book about manufactured doubt, looking at the history of how the tobacco industry, for example, wanting to continue to boost sales, tried to make it sound as though, oh, we don't really know for sure whether it causes cancer or not. And that went on for decades as people continued to die. Lo and behold, Exxon hired exactly the same PR firm that created that doubt campaign to try to foster doubt about climate change. And if people are doubtful, they're not going to get energized or involved or act on the issue. So sowing doubt can be heavily important to these vested interests. And then we continue to point out in the book, and we particularly want to say this here with Jim, is that skepticism is a healthy part of the scientific process, that this is something critical to being skeptical. Scientists value skepticism. They value looking at the results critically and carefully and being skeptical about whether this is really accurate. Um, but there's functional versus dysfunctional skepticism. And so what we would argue for is functional skepticism that you, if you see a result of a single study, dig deeper. If you hear something that seems a bit preposterous and someone's encouraging you to do it, maybe that's drinking bleach to cure COVID or something, um, <laughs> we would encourage you to look further. There are all sorts of ways in which we want to stay skeptical and we want to make sure that we are vetting the ideas that come across us. And so a caveat here is that we really are all susceptible. It's not an us and them issue. We did not write this book as a way to say, oh, those people out there who deny science, what's wrong with them? We really want to look at what are these human psychological tendencies that lead us down this path? Well, where do people find out about their science? Um, two different places, and we'll talk about both. One is um, media such as um, television uh, and cable news. But one challenge with the way science can be presented there is often it's presented in a balanced format, meaning they might put some scientist on with a science denier to debate a resolved issue like humans contributing to climate change. And to do that really creates this sense that it's a jump ball, that really we don't know, it's 50-50. And that is a sense where 
balance can then become biased. It can lead to a disproportionate visibility given to these science denialists and give the impression that it's um, you know unclear, uncertain, we just don't know. The BBC said, you know, we're not going to do that anymore with consensus science. So something like climate change, where the IPCC report based on so many contributors, so many scientists, so many um, studies, we're just not going to do this 50-50, quote, balanced reporting anymore because it sows doubt and it uh, exploits confusion over whether things are, are, are as really as uncertain <clears throat> as they're made to be seen. Where else do people get their science information? Well, often, you know, they just Google it, right? So um, when we search for scientific information in a digital world, um, it gets amplified um, through the internet and social media. I mean, we've had science denial for as long as we've had science and good examples coming from Galileo and. Darwin, but um, Galileo didn't have Twitter. And information, misinformation, disinformation, they're all proliferating uh, and being shared around the world in just seconds. And we all live in these echo chambers where we're hearing the same things that we already agree with and filter bubbles where we are restricted access to what others think. And this just reinforces what we already know and what we already believe. And we would like to see social media who's made some attempts to get rid of mis and disinformation do a lot more. Uh, Twitter, not too long ago, put on a button that if you go to share an article you haven't read, it asks you, you know, would you like to read this before you share it? And we would like to see a little bit more of that kind of um, regulation on online social media platforms. I'm gonna jump in there just quickly to say there's a news story in the past week that Pinterest has now um, prohibited uh, climate change doubt on their site. So they have now done the same thing they did with vaccinations in 2017 of directing people to accurate information if they try to search for that. Twitter also does that with vaccinations. And again, in the case of vaccinations, this was prior to COVID, this was the, the issue of parents in anti-vax groups and both Twitter and Pinterest made concerted effort to stop that. So we, we need more of that. It isn't just an individual solution. So the problem here is that algorithms are this basic organizing principle of digital life, but they're seldom understood. So if you think about Facebook and what it does is it feeds you more of what you want and it just doesn't matter to them if it's a set of falsehoods. That's how it works about an election, vaccinations, whatever it might be, they're feeding information based on an algorithm and yet people don't understand that well. I mean, I've done research with students in my lab and had them search for things and have been shocked at how little they understand. They actually believe that the top 10 hits in Google are somehow better than the others. They think that Google is using reliability and validity as a, a means of vetting information and that's just not happening. Um, online sources can be difficult to assess for validity, accuracy, and bias, in part because a lot of people have figured out how to game the system and how to present things that make it look as though they're very real. I had students Google something about, did dinosaurs live the same time as humans? Imagine that you're a kid writing a report on that. And it was shocking the number of top hits that came up confirming that from sites that looked very authoritative but they were all from very strong religious evangelistic groups. So at Stanford, Sam Weinberg did a study of 8,000 students from middle school, high school, and college, and had them do some searching and then look at whether they could assess bias, validity, accuracy, et cetera. And his claim that hit the media big time was that they were easily duped and he was just shocked by the degree to which that was true. They had so many misconceptions. But you know, how do individuals decide what knowledge to accept as valid? I mean, many are gonna go by what their friends post on Facebook, their social media bubbles. And we've had this awful erosion of, tr of trust and expertise. So that has been particularly problematic. And so these misconceptions that Sam Weinberg talks about are things like, oh, if it's .org, it's gotta be good. And if it's .com, it's gotta be bad. I mean, that's what they learned in middle school and the college students I've surveyed still think that. 
They think they can go to the about site, get accurate information to assess bias. And we'll talk about what people actually should do when we get around to what can individuals do. But they think, you know, if it looks good, there's a lot of information, there's some references, they're in safe territory. That's just not the case. So we just have not done enough in this country to figure out how to really teach both information literacy and algorithmic literacy, which the Pew Research Center, having done big surveys on this, now says needs to be part of the curriculum, the algorithmic part as well. So science denial, doubt, and resistance, psychological explanations. Again, the, the gist of this book is us surveying the psychological literature to understand how do we distill this down to a few key explanations that help people understand why we have denial, doubt, and resistance. So the first we're gonna talk about are thinking and reasoning biases, and we all have them. Once again, I wanna point that out. So we tend to rely on system one thinking, what Dan, Daniel Kahneman calls that, the um, Nobel Prize winning psychologist. He talks about system one versus system two. And typically we rely on system one. We make a quick intuitive response and social media feeds that. You know, you think about how quickly you can retweet something, laugh at it, move on, and you haven't stopped to really vet it. System one can be great if that's just, a, you know, you're trying to think, oh, what Thai restaurant do I want to go to? I'll Google what's local and see what people think of it. Or it's really good if you're driving and there's a kid running in front of you with chasing a ball. You, you want system one thinking. But it's not very good if you're trying to decide whether to take some strange drug to cure your COVID. Remember the ivermectin period where people were drinking worm <laughs> medicine. Um, you want to be analytical and deliberative. You want to turn on system two. And it's a good thing to do when you are confronted with information that is important to you, especially. Don't just have a knee-jerk reaction. So be analytical and deliberative. And we're not advocating that you be in that mode all the time. We're advocating conditional knowledge about knowing when to slow down and when to take your time and really vet information. Another key bias that most people have heard of now is confirmation bias this tendency that all humans have to seek, interpret, and recall information that aligns with pre-existing beliefs. So you can think about the last time maybe you tried to settle an argument with a friend and you got online and you searched for something. What terms did you put in and when did you stop? Probably as soon as you found what you already believed and what supported it. But that's a tendency we all have and we have to work against it. We have to be conscious of it and we have to fight it. And then there's the availability heuristic. So we believe the information we have available to us rather than thinking more broadly. And the favorite example that Gail and I have was when uh, Senator Jim Inhofe came to the, to the floor of the Senate with a snowball during what was called Snowmageddon in Washington, DC to say that we can't have global warming. Obviously, if we have snow in Washington, there is no global warming because what did he have available to him? A snowstorm. So that brings us to the next topic we discuss in the book that frames how people uh, interact with science, and that's social identity. We're all tribal creatures, and our group membership status is often a shortcut that we use uh, to influence our views on a scientific issue. You know, we tend to conform to our group. We want to adopt the norms and behaviors of our group. And we know in terms of communicating about science that in-group messages are more persuasive than the same message coming from an outsider. So our whole sense of self can be tied up in our social identity. And an example would be that if you identify strongly with a mother's group and that mother's group questions vaccine safety, and as Barbara said, this was going on long before the coronavirus, or if you have a conservative media viewer who's rejecting warnings about wearing masks, you might go along with what the group says um, as a shortcut to your understanding rather than employing that system to thinking and reasoning and weighing the scientific evidence that Barbara was talking about. And of course, all of these issues can bring up strong emotions. Our emotions about science are linked to our sense of self, our identity, our beliefs, and who do we trust? What epistemic authorities we trust? What news sources, what articles, what websites? 
um, Doug Lombardi and I did some research on teachers and um, we found that teachers share pretty much similar views to the general public in terms of their level of understanding and acceptance of climate change. I should point out that this study is dated and I think that that's shifting a little bit now, but teachers in this study, you know, they were angry and sometimes felt some hopelessness and those kinds of emotions were predictive of whether they felt that, uh, you know, climate change was plausible. Was it plausible that humans were impacting the climate? Um, for example, when they had more anger, they found it less plausible. When they had more hopelessness, they found it more plausible. So their emotions were really getting into how they evaluated the scientific evidence. And we found it interesting that teachers who did not teach about climate change showed greater anger than those who did not, suggesting maybe if you know a little bit more about it and you're more informed, that's helpful in mitigating emotions effects. But here at the bottom, we see a teacher who had followed the climate gate saga. And some of you may know what that was, but it was the release of a tranche of emails that taken out of context could be really misinterpreted. And, climate skeptics and deniers really jumped on that and it became a media brouhaha. And this teacher said, oh yeah, you know, that climate gate thing, the scientists lied, they discredited themselves. And then how am I going to believe you? If you come out with another statement, are you lying again? What is your agenda? And you can see that these kinds of comments were comments we heard about Dr. Fauci when Dr. Fauci said, wear a mask, or we don't need to wear a mask, or wash your groceries, we don't need to wash your groceries. As evidence changed, they changed their ideas. But if you are skeptical of a certain authority, you might be really questioning those changes in opinion and questioning whether there's an agenda. And that brings us to motivated reasoning, which maybe many of you've heard of. And the, these are motivations that can bias our understanding of information. You know, we can be kind of shifting towards evaluation of evidence based on our preferred conclusion, not necessarily the accurate conclusion. Lots of research has shown that individuals are quite a bit more critical of research studies and their methodology if they don't really like the outcome. So uh, that's really an important thing to keep in mind. And our identities can actually inform how we feel about these things and then impact our reasoning towards a particular conclusion. So we know that the acceptance of certain scientific findings, like for example, on climate change can be highly politicized and that can influence the reasoning that we, that we have towards that. Um, we see that um, liberals are more accepting of humans contributing to climate change, although we see a little bit of shift over time, we're still seeing uh, a more um, conservative groups being more skeptical of uh, whether humans are making a huge impact. But then again, liberals have their own concerns about other kinds of scientific issues uh, such as um, nuclear um, energy. And so it's not only one group that struggles with scientific ideas. So another construct we want to introduce here, because I think this is one that's probably less well known and yet one that we find really helpful for understanding science denial, doubt, and resistance. So it's called epistemic cognition, which is basically thinking about knowledge. So how individuals think and reason about knowledge and how they apply those beliefs. So what is knowledge? How do we know what we know? What are our sources? And Gail and I've written about how this influences science understanding. And it's a, a really critical process that gets employed when we have to decide, well, what counts as evidence? And what about if there are two differing ideas about knowledge claims or how do I evaluate information? Well, I've read these multiple articles. How do I put them together? How do I put new knowledge in? So that's always at the forefront when we're doing those kinds of intellectual tasks. And yet most people don't have this name for it, but we wanna introduce this because we're gonna talk a little bit about how this might work too. 
So this is a shorthand version of a developmental scheme of epistemic cognition. And I have talked to a lot of people about this recently who have found it really helpful in terms of understanding others and their thinking. So one of the ways in which people can think is as absolutist. They think of knowledge as something that's dualistic and certain, it's right and wrong, black and white. And you can think about the teacher that Gail just quoted and how that just shows an absolutist view. Well, they lied to me. You know, this is, or back to how this is a poor understanding of science. This is the difficulty of not understanding that scientific knowledge changes. And so at one point, 97% of climate scientists agree. I think now it's pretty much universal that they agree. Then they would think, well, okay, then that means the knowledge is uncertain and I just can't trust it if they don't all agree. But there's an, another way of thinking that is called multiplism where all knowledge is tentative and relative and there's no basis for assessing knowledge claims. And so scientific claims are just one set of opinions. And you can think about, okay, well, some people think this and some people think that, and there isn't any way to really know. So I just have to think about, oh, trusting this particular person. And so both of these ways of thinking, absolutism and multiplism, play into a post-truth society quite well and into authoritarian political movements. It's very convenient to have people thinking these ways and then just trusting you, the, the authoritarian leader. So what we strive for, however, in our teaching and in education is evaluativist thinking, the sense that, there, that there's a relative nature of certainty, that there are means for evaluating knowledge claims. There are means for evaluating sources of authority. And there's this valuing of evidence back to the scientific attitude and the power of critical thinking. So I think what we try to do in our classes is foster individuals towards this kind of thinking. But very often in conversations now, I'm well aware when I think, ah, I, you know, I can understand where they're coming from and hmm, it might not be full of evaluativism here. And unfortunately, evaluativist thinking is not all that common in adults in the United States, sadly. So what can we do about science denial? So one of the things we wanted to do in writing this book was take it beyond the explanations and really try to give people some ways to cope with this particular issue, both for themselves and for others. So first, we talked about what can individuals do? Well, cultivate a scientific attitude and nurture science appreciation in others. So I'm a grandparent and I strive to do this with my grandchildren. You know, I've bought science kits and taken them on nature walks and talk about evidence and observation and what we're learning and help them evaluate what they hear. I think these are critical aspects of whatever your role might be, your job, your parenting, your grandparenting, whatever you do, we have the ability to influence others to think more critically about science and about evidence. Individually, we can all improve our search skills and how we evaluate scientific claims and sources, and Gail will tell us a bit more about that in a minute, but that is a really key part of it. And I, you know, a lot of libraries and certainly college libraries have sites where you can go to get particular training in this that you can just do online. It's really helpful. Uh, we can all be more aware of our cognitive biases and our motivations and our own reasoning. We can try to employ system two thinking when we need to. Pull back and think and really be aware of how you're vetting information that's come to you. Really importantly in this particular time and probably the hardest thing to do is to learn to listen to others with curiosity, compassion, and openness. To try to get beyond our own biases, to try to figure out how someone else is seeing the world. This is not easy to do. And I think sometimes instead of thinking, why do they think that way? <laughs> we can think, huh, who's benefiting from getting them to think that way? Who's got a vested interest here that has persuaded them to think like that? But often also we can just be open and aware and curious. And I think um, Gail was talking about social identity. We can also be aware that people have multiple social identities. So if you are trying to be persuasive in a conversation with someone, you can think about how to, where is it that you do relate? Where do you connect? So in my case, it might be, oh, I'm a grandparent, you are too. Well, let's, let's think about what the planet's gonna be like for our grandchildren. I did this in a conversation with a climate denier and he softened and changed. It was, he opened to the possibility of talking about it and revealed that it was actually he had economic concerns. He wasn't the, as the big denier he had presented himself to be. He was fearful. 
So you can find a point of connection very often, and that can be extremely helpful. Most importantly, we can vote for those who value, support, and fund science and who base their policy decisions on evidence. Once upon a time, I don't think I would have needed to have said that. I think I assumed that many people did, but that has not been the case recently. So we need to make sure that we are putting people in office who really care about science and who use evidence as the basis for policy decisions. So as Barbara mentioned, we can each improve our own sourcing skills. And Doug Lombardi and I wrote about this in an academic article a while back. And you know, we have some steps that we try to take and we encourage others to take too. And the first is just to stop, stop, step back, be vigilant, employ that system one thinking um, you know, very quickly to share, but we don't wanna do that. We really wanna step back and we wanna think whether this is something we should share. Um, so scan an article and ask yourself, um, is this explanation plausible? And then how do I know it's not just, yeah, it sounds good to me, or yeah, that I like the way that um, comes out. I like the outcome. We really want to be thinking about uh, why we are judging a, a particular explanation as plausible. And then become your own fact checker. So one of the things we suggest is open another window and read what's called laterally. This is uh, what we were talking about, the Stanford study of how to be a little bit, read a little bit more like a fact checker. So open another window and read about the source, read to see if who the person is that's uh, done this study or is talking about this particular finding. What kind of expertise do they have? Are other people sharing this information widely and who are they? What are their motivations for sharing it? These are questions you, you want to ask before you um, accept a new piece of scientific evidence. Always evaluate the connection between the evidence sources and alternative claims as well. In other words, what's the alternative claim? Is this true or is the alternative true? Which does the evidence support? And then you might reappraise your own plausibility judgment of the original claim and then come back to that, make a tentative judgment, and we're, we're suggesting it's a little bit of an iterative process, and then only share information that you've verified. And then when you share it, share just, you know, not only what you know, but how you know it. Hey, I found this information. I did some research. It looks like it's true. I found it on CDC website, what or however you found it. It sounds like this is, you know, going to take a semester long course to be able to do this. But in fact, once you get facile at these steps, you know, you can do them in a few minutes. And if you don't have time to do it, then we recommend that you don't share it until you do. What can educators do? We're both educators. What can educators do in K through 12 and higher education to promote uh, better science literacy? Well, first, educators need to enhance their own science understanding. Elementary teachers often don't have a lot of science background. And so we can all get more literate in science just by exploring scientific topics. Um, teach about the nature of science. We went earlier, we were talking about the next generation science standards who that emphasizes the process of science and evaluation of evidence. So it's really more about teaching how to understand information, how scientific information is created, not just about a bunch of facts in a textbook, because let's face it, science facts are changing all the time. So just memorizing a bunch of facts is really not learning about science at all. Foster scientific thinking in all students. Barbara mentioned the scientific attitude that we think is very useful. Well, it's not just useful for someone going into STEM careers. Scientific attitude is great for problem solving. Your electricity went out in the house and what happened? Did you blow a fuse or is the power out in the neighborhood? You can test these things out using your scientific reasoning skills. We recommend educators teach real world applications of science. The kids are famous for asking, you know, when am I gonna use this? Why do I need to know this? Those are really good questions. And educators should really be teaching science embedded in an application of that for kids to 
improve their own lives and understand what's going on around them. Um, we're motivation researchers, Barbara and I, and a major tenet of motivation is choice. Kids should have choices in what kinds of investigations they explore, what kinds of inquiry do they engage in. Teachers need to be more aware of the strong beliefs, attitudes, and identities that students come into their classrooms with. I think K through 12 educators are probably better on this than higher ed educators because they often, K-12 educators live in the community and they, they know their, their surrounding community and they're often teaching their neighbors eight-year-old. But in higher education, I think this is even more of a problem because students will come to a university from all over the United States and in fact, all over the world. And they may have very different points of view that professors don't necessarily spend enough time getting familiar with. Recognize that students are going to have emotions about science. Emotions is how we think and learn. We think and learn through our emotions. So we can't quote, get rid of our emotions or put them aside, but we need to recognize them and give students the opportunity to understand why they're upset about this or understand why they feel hopeless or confused and work through that with students rather than trying to uh, push emotions underground because that usually doesn't work. And then foster digital science literacy, like Barbara was saying earlier, with understanding how to search for and evaluate these algorithms that push certain information to the top. So what can science communicators do? I don't know if any of you out there are science communicators, but I hope so, because we think there's a, an important role for people communicating science. And one of the concerns that many people have is that scientists are not trained to write for the general public. That's, that's not what they do. And yet there are many good workshops going on now to help scientists learn to communicate about the work that they do in ways that the public can understand. And we need more writers who write about science for the general public. It's just dismaying to look at how many newspapers have dropped their science section, dropped their science reporters. In the last 10 years, there's been a dramatic decrease in the number of people who are writing for the general public. And yet there are some wonderful venues. I know the Atlantic has hired several people. There are lots of ways in which people are communicating about science effectively. And what we would encourage is that people write about how scientists know as much as what they know, back to the basic nature of science that we discussed. And of course, science communicators have to know something about their audience in the same way Gail talked about knowing about your students. And provide evidence for scientific claims. Make it clear what the study was and how it was done. And as we talked about earlier, avoid the both sides reporting unsettled topics and because this can create bias and a poor understanding of science. It's hard because I, I understand the impulse to think, well, you know, we, we better show that there's some people just don't believe this and we better put that in too. That is not helpful at all if it's a topic that is settled. And finally, in our book, we write about policymakers and what can policymakers do? We want to see policymakers hire and listen to science advisors. Science, as we've said, is pretty complex and we don't expect every policymaker to be up to speed on the latest findings in a particular area. So, you know, tap that expertise. It's out there. Hire those people and use empirical evidence for the basis for sound public policy. We'd like to see a lot of support for education standards that emphasize how to think over what to think. We like to list topics that we want students to learn about, but we should spend more time emphasizing how we want students to think. Um, we need to push back on this current trend of ignoring factual basis of claims. Um, getting tired of hearing people say, well, you know, I just don't believe that, I think this. Well, what is your evidence? People should be pushed. Why do you think that? Where are you getting your information? Too, too often we just accept that uh, they just have an alternative facts. That's not good enough. We need to push people to ground their claims about science in real evidence. We definitely would like to see more rigorous teacher preparation standards that help them become uh, much more fluent in science to help their students achieve that fluency as well. And we want social media to be more responsible, transparent, and accountable. 
And I'm not sure if Elon Musk has the same idea of that as I do. So we'll see what happens with uh, the, his interest in being more influential um, over Twitter. But we want all platforms to be open and transparent and responsible. And we want them to watch out for dangerous sharing of mis and disinformation. Thank you very much for listening. And we're super excited to take your questions. All right, thank you both very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, I should mention, because you both mentioned uh, Naomi Oreskes a couple of times, the, the book that she and her co-author wrote are the merchants is The Merchants of Doubt. And there's also, I think, a documentary of, uh, yeah. of that same title. So um, they go into some of that stuff as well. Barbara mentioned um, her grandkids. Someone asked, uh, uh, Trudy asked, what age should we begin science education for kids? Soon as they can talk. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. Or maybe before that. I mean, I, I can remember when I was pulling them in a wagon before they were two and teaching them how to observe nature. You know, we were smelling plants and we were touching things and identifying things and talking about it. I mean, it's lifelong. It's not something you wait for at all. It's just you figure out what's age appropriate to introduce them to the natural world and to help them understand the knowledge we have about it and how that knowledge was gathered and how they can contribute to that process, how they can participate. Yeah, there's a great book called The Scientist in the Crib about how uh, babies are you know, in, uh, inquisitive little creatures and we should foster that from as early on as possible. Alison Gopnik, great book. Thank you, I was blanking on the yeah. author. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, uh, religious teaching starts at such an early age. Why shouldn't science teaching yeah. start that early? Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, some people wanted to know, are there, did you notice any regional differences in terms of some of these denial issues, particularly climate change or the teaching of evolution? <laughs> Sure, sure. I think, you know, different areas have different um, political uh, leanings and uh, issues of concern. So we certainly see that playing out regionally. Um, you know, we, we know that um, Southern California moms pre-pandemic uh, were very vaccine hesitant and we saw a lot of outbreaks of measles and other um, diseases that uh, vaccines can um, uh, take care of. So that's an issue there. We know that more conservative evangelical communities, particularly in the South, are a little more uncomfortable with evolution, some a little bit more uncomfortable with climate change. So yeah, it, it does tend to be somewhat regional and also aligned with uh, political and or religious ideology. And I want to say I feel for teachers in those regions. Gail and I met with some teachers in the, in the South on Saturday for a book discussion that was organized by National Science Teachers Association. Is that what it was? NSTA. Okay. So the regional organization. And th these teachers are having a really tough time. I mean, it's not easy to be teaching in areas where parents are demanding that certain things not be taught or not be discussed when they are good scientific practices and this is there's good information about them and it's it's a struggle. Yeah, I should mention the uh, Center for Inquiry has a program called the Teachers Institute for Evolutionary Science run by Bertha Vasquez, who's a teacher herself. And she would probably say that this can crop up anywhere. It's not just North yeah. and South. Yeah. It's maybe a little bit more rural a base just because they tend to be a little more religious, but um, yeah, they're afraid to teach it or they're just afraid to of the blowback from the parents. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Do you ever, do you see any science denial from scientists? I know we see, sometimes you see scientists who sort of go off the rails in another discipline where they think because they have a PhD in one area, they can talk about anything else. 
Yes, we do see that. Um, just because you have expertise in, you know, nuclear physics, you really shouldn't be weighing in on the infectious disease policies regarding COVID, right? Because that isn't your area. And we did did and do see people um, who maybe should stay a little bit more in their lane because um, as we've pointed out, you know, science is really complex. And just because you are a scientist doesn't mean you understand other areas of science. Right, right. Someone mentioned this is, I, we hear this sometime from the, we, the woo community, we call them the woo community. Talk about other ways of knowing. Have you heard this term? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so address that. Well, I, I don't know exactly what the person meant about it, but if I think about other ways of knowing, I think about people who do not exactly privilege evidence, but go more on what might be heartfelt or intuitive or gut level kind of thing, that they trust those kind of intuitions over empirical evidence. I, I, I think it is good to listen to your, your gut, your intuition about certain kinds of things, and then go test that against what we happen to know empirically. Plus there are other ways of knowing that are valuable in other ways. So yes. you know, religious beliefs can be valuable, can you know, teach you about uh, morality, can have lessons for life. Um, so those are other ways of knowing. Uh, the problem is when you try to mix epistemologies and apply one to the other, and I, I don't think you should apply religious tests to scientific evidence, and I don't think you should apply scientific tests to, to people's faith either. I think those are uh, kind of different realms, but um, other ways of knowing might be faith-based or might be different, different communities. For example, science is particularly Western in its orientation. There's other um, ways of um, communing with nature and learning about nature, indigenous ways, for example. So there's other yeah. ways of knowing that have their own values and they should be listened to for what they have to say in, in those realms. And that can be very useful and informative. Yes. Which sort of brings up a, a, a semi-related idea that, um, do you have any thoughts about how to get more women and people of color interested in STEM? topics and, and education? Yes, yeah, stop discouraging them. <laughs> uh, we actively discourage rather than encourage people of color, women, people with disabilities, um, LGBT communities from pursuing science. And how do we do that? Um, we make it um, very unwelcoming and we, we make it very, you know, white male centric. And so we don't provide them with a sense that they can and should be doing science and that they can and should feel belonging. And so really, um, you know, people don't come to parties they're not invited to. Yeah, and take it from me, who's dead, dealt with this share of crackpots, the, there's plenty of them who are white male. So they, <laughs> no one's got the, a lock on truth in this world. But okay. one, one more point about that that's really important. Um, when uh, women started entering medical profession in greater numbers, we learned that the symptoms for a heart attack and heart disease in women were decidedly different than the symptoms for heart disease in, in men. And so adding multiple points of view into science actually enhances our understanding of science because new people may have different questions and may look at different things, employing the mechanisms of science and the research of science to do so. But we learn a lot by being more inclusive. Questions that men may not even have thought to Just not ask have thought someone. of, right. Right. Okay, I want to ask one more question since you've, you've both been around the block with this topic a little bit and you sort of touched on it earlier, but any advice for people just dealing with their naughty uncles or people at the Thanksgiving table who, you know, are... QAnon or drinking bleach or whatever wacky ideas they have, how do you how do you deal with them? I, I you know, I would say what I said earlier of listen with compassion and be curious. If you can turn on your curiosity and try to really get into their head, why are they thinking that and really press their thinking? Often people have made decisions based on their social media influence without even really critically thinking about it. And if you can get them to critically think about it, 
but without being in attack mode, but from a genuine position of, you know, I really want to understand you. I want to know why you think the way you do. The flip side of this is Gail and I talk a lot about the movable middle, the people who can be persuaded and trying to give to, to not think about the people who are too far gone that you can't really do it. We don't go to flat earth conventions. We're not, you know, we're not going off there to try to convince people who are way out there with their beliefs. And, and that's just not the case for most people. Many people are still able to be influenced. And again, use that point of connection, use the identities you have in common. Uh, think about the ways in which you can influence them effectively from a point of connection. Yeah, and I would double down on that listening part. You know, we, my niece was hesitant to get vaccinated for COVID and I just asked her, you know, why? And she said, well, I heard it causes infertility. Well, that's a legitimate concern. It doesn't happen to be a correct uh, concern, but it's legitimate to be concerned about infertility if you're a young woman, right? So you just, you got to legitimize that. And I, I did, I said, wow, that, that would be very dis disconcerting indeed. So I haven't heard that. Why don't you talk to your doctor and find out if that's a real thing? And then you should, you should, you should do that before you proceed to get a vaccine. She did. She found out it wasn't a concern. She got vaccinated and then she went back and told her friend from Facebook who told her that, that it wasn't true. And the friend went and got vaccinated. So sometimes listening to what the concern is and legitimizing their concern without legitimizing their point, you can get a little further. And, and recognize that people really can change. I mean, there was a yoga teacher in my community who was part of the anti-vax group, you know, the, and anti-vax in terms of not giving her child childhood vaccinations. And she was very proud of that. It fit with her worldview and back to alternative ways of knowing. It fit with the home birth, breastfeeding group, play group that she had been with for so long. And so she didn't vaccinate her child. And then she had an epiphany through conversations with a number of people over time who, who made her see that this was, in her words, a selfish act, that she was threatening the other children who went to school who couldn't get vaccinated, as one mom told her. And so she not only went and got her daughter all her vaccinations at age nine, but she wrote a lovely article about it in our local paper to really try to share with other people. It, and it, it always reminds me that people can change. It's that we have to keep that in mind. People are not locked into their worldview and their beliefs. And with time, with more information, with persuasive conversations, with an awareness that your actions do affect other people, especially in the case of whether you get vaccinated or not, um, change is possible. We're psychologists, we have to believe that. <laughs> you have to be optimists. <laughs> there is hope, everybody. Well, thank you both very much, Barbara Hofer, Gail Sinatra, are the authors of Science Denial, Why It Ma Why It Science Denial, Why It Matters and What to Do About It. Why it happens <laughs> and what to do. Why it matters, why it happens. It matters it too, happens. Jim. <laughs> All these whys are answered in the book. Go out and buy it tonight. Uh, thank you both very much. And thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Skeptical Inquirer Presents. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim, for having us. We appreciate it.